Hey Storm, so obviously the first thing you're gonna need is to get a camera. And you're really in luck because there's never been so many good camera options out there. But before we get into any of that, you should really decide what you're gonna use the camera for. What are you trying to capture? Are you shooting photos? Are you shooting videos? Are you trying to be a content creator? If you're just getting into photo or you're just trying to get into video, I strongly recommend that you learn how to do both because the skills kind of come hand in hand. And on top of that, there might be an opportunity that comes down the road where you might actually wanna do photo. And there might be another opportunity where you actually want to do video. And so it's a really good idea to have a camera that can really capture both. The skills from photography and the skills from videography have a lot of overlap, and it's really not that much work to learn both skills. And the other major aspect to consider before you actually start looking for cameras is determining your budget. And unless you got money burning in your pocket, I strongly suggest looking at secondhand equipment. And camera technology in the last five years has gone so good that any one of those cameras will probably get you pretty far. And you're gonna have lots of options. Sony, for example, has released already over 23 cameras for their e-mount system since 2017. And realistically, any one of those cameras will probably be more than enough to get you going. And you can find some really good used gear websites like b &H, Amazon Warehouse, KEH, and MPB. I've used all these websites before to buy used gear, and they all have some type of inspection service and some type of warranty when you buy the camera. You can feel safe that even though you're buying used equipment, you're still gonna have some type of coverage in case something goes wrong in the first bit. And if you're willing, you can even find better deals on Marketplace if you're willing to barter and do a little bit more research. Personally, a lot of my equipment has actually been purchased secondhand. They're all have been great pickups, and I've never actually had any issues with any of my secondhand equipment equipment. Obviously, if you go down that route, do your due diligence, but you can get some really great deals on Marketplace. Now, if you do go down the secondhand equipment route, these are the things that you should be looking out for. You want to look for how many actuations the camera has had. Actuations is how many times the shutter has opened and closed. Usually shutters are rated between 200 and 500,000 actuations. You can think of low shutter count, kind of like low mileage on a used car. And if you're looking at secondhand equipment on Marketplace, be sure to inspect like the sensor, any physical damage on the body, make sure the SD card slots work, and just take test photos just to ensure that everything is in the clear. Also keep in mind while you're budgeting that the camera is only half the equation and you should still allocate a lot of your budget for the lens. Now, let's get into the good stuff. So the next thing you need to know is sensor size. Size matters, and in this case, it kind of doesn't. This is a big sensor. Bigger sensors usually mean they have better image quality and better low light performance, but the handoff is that they're gonna be much bigger, much heavier, and a lot more expensive. Smaller sensors, on the other hand, can be put into much smaller packages and they're usually a lot more affordable. It really comes down to it, all these cameras are super capable and I've taken amazing photos on all of them. Even this little guy. To my very first housing for it. This was actually my first underwater camera. These are actually photos I've taken with this camera and no one even knows that this is a little tiny point and shoot. Nowadays, all cameras can give you great results. The only difference is that some sensors can give you a little bit more utility because they're smaller and they can fit in your pocket or better low light performance shoot 30 frames per second. But in the end, all these cameras can do the exact same thing. Apple even shot their entire M3 keynote event on an iPhone 15. Of course, they've had a couple million in lighting and rigging. It just goes to show that any camera in the right hands can get amazing results. Man, I don't know why I thought this was a good idea to shoot this video on a hammock. It is super not comfortable. <laughs> I've been at this for two hours and my back is just like, ooh. Okay. So the next thing about sensors is the megapixel count. Megapixels is how much resolution your sensor is capable of recording. After 12 megapixels, it doesn't really matter all that much. And the reason why I say that is because most mediums don't require that much resolution to have stunning results. If you look at video, for example, 1080p video is only 2.1 megapixels. And 4K video, on the other hand, is only about 8.3 megapixels. So you don't really need a lot of resolution. There's only really two reasons why megapixel count really matters is is when you're in post-processing, you're probably gonna run into an instance where you wanna crop an image down to get better framing. To do so and maintain a high enough image quality, you're gonna need enough resolution for it to maintain a good amount of information. Ooh, that, that was a beefy way of saying that. <laughs> Gross. And the second reason why megapixels matters is photo printing quality. But realistically, this is really dependent on your viewing distance from the photo. The subject could really be its own video altogether. Just know that 12 megapixels is enough for a 20 by 30 inch print and no one's really printing that large anyways, so I wouldn't worry about it. And on top of that, most cameras nowadays are probably a baseline of 24 megapixels anyways, so you're gonna have a lot more resolution than you will probably ever need. And if you ever really needed the extra resolution, AI upscaling is actually a revolutionary tool and you could use that in a pinch and get amazing results. 
Now, if you're looking for a video camera, I would strongly suggest as a baseline that the camera can at least do 1080p 60 frames per second and 4K 24 frames per second. And you're really in luck because most cameras in the last few years should be able to do both of these. Now the 60 FPS is gonna allow you to record some action shots and get some really good slow-mo footage. And with the 4K footage, you can actually just crop in and get a tighter framing. And so you actually kind of get two shots for the price of one shot. So in the last few years, consumer grade cameras have been getting stacked with a lot of features. For video, there's really two that are really important. And the one that's probably the most revolutionary is actually in-body image stabilization or IBIS for short. It makes your sensor move inside your camera and it counteracts the micro jitters that your hands will do. So as a result, your footage is going to look a lot more sharper and stable and it's going to allow you to shoot handheld a lot more freely than what it used to be like. Second most important feature is actually 10-bit video. 10-bit video has been out for a while now, but it's only been available for consumer grade cameras in the last few iterations. And if you shot an 8-bit video before, you're going to realize 8-bit, 8-bit, 8-bit footage, 8 bit footage quickly falls apart if you don't shoot it correctly. What 10-bit video allows you to do is to have a lot more control in your coloring and gives you a lot more forgiving footage where if you underexposed a bit or overexposed a bit, even just shot in the wrong white balance, you're going to have a lot more playroom in the footage to fix those things. And the next thing you're probably thinking about is form factor. And so there's DSLR cameras, mirrorless cameras, and fixed lens cameras. Now I'm gonna say this, but it's gonna be a little bit controversial, but DSLR cameras are kind of like old flip phones. They're still functional, but they don't get all the new features of the new cameras. Now there is many great DSLRs out there, but I'm gonna strongly suggest that you don't go down that route and get a mirrorless camera instead. The thing is, as you grow in your photography career, you wanna be in an ecosystem that is growing with you. Mirrorless cameras is where the industry is going and changing ecosystems is very costly. Most of the time you actually can't take anything from the previous ecosystem to your new ecosystem. So if you ever wanted to go to a DSLR to a mirrorless camera, you actually can't use anything besides maybe lenses. You can adapt the lenses, but you, sometimes you lose autofocus. I recommend if you're just starting out to just jump into the ecosystem that you want to be in. Lastly, we have fixed lens cameras. And these cameras are actually my favorite cameras and they excel in the exact single thing that they are designed to do. And this is an example of a fixed lens camera where it's a camera where you can't actually take the lens off. I wouldn't get one of these cameras until you know a little bit more about photography and know exactly what type of focal lengths and what you like to shoot before you commit to a fixed lens camera. How do you choose a camera brand? I'm gonna say most brands are pretty much all the same, but as of 2023 and 2024, I would say there is one brand that has an ecosystem that's way better than the rest. The Sony E-mount system has over 200 lens options, not just from Sony themselves. Third-party makers like Sigma, Tamron, Samyang, they have lenses for every size, shape, use, weight, whatever that you can think of. It's not even that they just have a lot of lens options. They were early adopters of IBIS, so most of Sony's cameras excel in both photo and video. You can just pick up like a five-generation old camera and still get both features sets for a very good price. Now let's talk about lenses. Your first lens is probably going to be a kit lens, which is the lens that comes with your camera body and usually covers the most common focal range. And the thing is with kit lenses that usually back in the day, kit lenses usually were not very good lenses and were <laughs> pretty much trash. And it was something that everyone would just kind of throw away. But the thing is nowadays, kit lenses are actually really good. They're definitely good enough where you could definitely start using that lens, get good results and develop their skills. Unless you had a very specific type of photography that you wanted to get into, like wildlife, sports, architecture, landscapes, astrophotography, I would suggest getting one prime lens and learning everything about that lens. And if you don't know what prime lens is, a prime lens is a lens that limits itself to one focal length. And the trade-off is that you won't be able to zoom anymore, but your aperture can get very large you can capture a lot more light, so you get better low light performance. You also get a lot more bokeh. If you wanna get really good at photography and videography really fast, the limitations of using one focal length will excel you to learn everything. And most people will probably recommend you a Nifty 50 as your first prime lens, and I'm gonna suggest that you don't get one of those. 
Usually this lens is too zoomed in for any indoor application. Most introductory cameras are gonna be APS-C size sensors. They're just physically smaller sensors than a full frame camera. Because of this, APS-C size sensors have a 1.5 times crop factor, which makes lenses even more zoomed in. So if you bought a 50 millimeter lens and using it on APS-C size sensor, you're actually getting a 75 millimeter lens, which is reaching telephoto territory. And so for people using APS-C size sensors, I actually recommend them getting a 24 millimeter lens. And if you're shooting on full frame, I recommend them getting a 35 millimeter lens. With this focal length, you can shoot indoors, outdoors, landscapes, portraiture, whatever. It's just very versatile and usually can get you by with 90% of situations. And because you can use this lens for pretty much any application, you're gonna learn how to take photos really fast. So what accessories do you actually need? I suggest that you at least get a camera bag. If you get a bag that's too big or you overfill your bag, you'll quickly realize you're not gonna take your bag anywhere. And if you're not taking your bag with you, you're definitely not gonna be taking photos. I recommend that your first bag is a bag that can only hold a maximum of three lenses or 10 liters or smaller. And this is actually a subject I touched base on this video. So if you wanna learn more of why I suggest this, go watch this video. Now, this one isn't really necessary, but I do strongly recommend getting a quality camera strap. It doesn't really matter the brand, but I do suggest if you get a heavier camera, is to get a wider camera strap. You don't wanna be using a big heavy camera and using a tiny little spaghetti string like this. It's just gonna dig into your shoulder a lot and it's just not gonna be comfortable. So just keep in mind, heavy camera, big strap, little camera, little, little dinky strap. I also strongly recommend that you get the camera strap that has quick releases because these things are amazing. You're gonna be taking them on and off all the time. So it's just better to have. Get them early while you can so you don't end up buying like two or three camera straps like I did. Oh my God. Okay, I think I need to get off this hammock. Is it time for my corny outro now? <laughs> if you're gonna remember anything from this video, Remember that the best gear is whatever gets you out shooting. Commitment to the craft is actually how you get better. It doesn't matter if you spend a lot of money on equipment or not a lot of money on equipment. If you're not out shooting, you're not getting better. So stay focused and hit that shutter button. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Whoop.